Hello, this is Mr. Wolf, and we are continuing to read Blood on the River, Jamestown 1607, by Elisa Carbone, and we are on to chapter 20. Thus did they show us their feats of arms, and others art and dancing, some other us to their oaten pipe, and others voices chanting. William Simmons' edition, Proceedings. The morning we are to leave for Werewakamoko, I am jittery with excitement. Namantak is too. It will be his first time home since he went to England. He will have lots of stories to tell his people. You will love my home, he says to me. It is, I know, I interrupt him. It is much better than my home. We both laugh. Namantak collects the gifts he received in England. A red velvet cassock, which he says is not as warm as a deerskin mantle a pewter chalice, which he says is not as good as a gourd to drink out of, an ivory tooth scraper, which he refuses to use because he says the Indian way of cleaning his teeth with sassafras root is much better. I gather my spoon and bowl in a water skin. We present ourselves to Captain Smith, each with a small bundle to carry. Captain Smith looks up from cleaning his musket. Samuel, where is your sword? Where is your armor? Go back and get properly attired. But I thought we were at peace with the Powhatans, I want to say. I know better to than to argue with Captain Smith, so I simply go to my cabin and do as he says. At least he is not making me carry my heavy musket on the hike to where Wakamoko. When I get back to the cap to Captain Smith's cabin, the carpenter John Layden is sitting out front with his tools, working at it, making a small wooden chest. He is carving initials into the top of the chest. He already has an A, and as I watch, he finishes a B. Who is that for? I ask. He keeps his eyes cast down, intent on his work, and does not answer me. Then it dawns on me. I tip my head close to his. Is it for her? I whisper. He glances at me, and I see he is afraid to tell me, afraid I will announce it and give other men a chance to ridicule him. I look at the small chest. It is beautifully crafted, out of cherry wood. A work of love. I watch him as he begins to carve a border around the initials. John Layton is a quiet man. He is sturdy and kind, and he is the only man who has decided to woo Miss Anne Burris with something other than bragging and strutting. I lean close again. She likes flowers, too, I say. He gives me a quick smile and continues his work. Captain Smith is ready to go. He carries his musket and has not one but two bandoliers of gunpowder slung across his chest. His sword hangs at his side and he is wearing full armour. He looks like he is going into battle not like he is visiting someone to invite them to come get some presents. This crowning of Powhatan must be a truly bad idea. There are only six of us going. Me, Captain Smith, Namantek, and three soldiers. We hike over land for about twelve miles. When we come to the Pamonkey River, which separates us from where Wakamoko, we find a, cab a canoe in the rushes and use it to paddle across. When we reach the other side, I see nothing but the tall, grand trees with their leaves turning red and gold. Come, says Namatek. Peakwaf. A worn footpath brings us up into the woods, and soon I smell the, cook the smoke from cook fires. Namatek breathes deeply and smiles. He is coming home. We come to where the houses of where Wakamoko are gathered. Straw-coloured rectangular houses with curved roofs. There are at least twenty of them scattered among the trees, with gardens in between. They are about the size of ours, but made out of rushes woven together. Three small boys run out to greet us. Namantek lifts the littlest one into the air. He laughs and says in Algonquin, You grew so much while, you, while I was gone. You must have eaten a whole bear. More people from the village come to see who has arrived. Captain Smith speaks with one of the elders. 
he tells him we have gifts for Chief Powhatan brought from England. Will the great chief come to Jamestown to receive his gifts? The elder says that Chief Powhatan is in another village thirty miles away. He will send for we, he will send for him immediately, but he will not arrive until tomorrow. I am relieved. I do not have to. We do not have to anger Chief Powhatan quite yet. It is beginning to get dark, and the air is filled with the chirping of crickets and cicadas. The elder motions for us to follow him, and he leads us into a field. Two young boys lay down mats for us to sit on, and then they build a fire. Are we being invited for supper? Are they about to start cooking on the fire, I wonder? We sit on the mats, and various people from the village come to sit near us. A few old men and women, many children and young warriors. They are all silent, their faces expectant, as if they are waiting for something to happen. But no one brings food to the cook on the fire. My stomach begins to churn. What is going on? What are they expecting to happen? I am glad I have my sword. But what are they going to do to us? Captain Smith sits on the mat next to me. His eyes are wary, and I know that he too suspects this might be a trap. I touch his sleeve. What are they doing? I whisper. Suddenly, shrieking and howling erupt from the forest, the same battle cries I heard the night James was killed. I leap to my feet and pull out my sword, ready to fight and slash. Captain Smith draws his sword. He seizes an old man sitting near us and holds the sword to his throat. Our soldiers aim their muskets into the dark forest. The howling comes closer, louder. Our attackers will be upon us at any moment. And out of the darkness a little girl comes running. She rushes up to us and stands bravely in front of the loaded muskets. It is Pocahontas. I promise no harm will come to you, she says, holding out her hands, palms up. If I am wrong, you may kill me. Captain Smith lets go of the old man. He translates what Pocahontas has said for the soldiers, and they slowly lower their muskets. All right, Captain Smith says, still looking wary. Pocahontas recognizes me and smiles. She comes to me and, she, and Captain Smith and gives us what that same look of expectancy I've been seeing all evening. Just watch, she says. Then, in English, she adds, you like. I grin. Captain Smith must have taught her some English words coming her, during her visits to our fort and, her visits in, and his visits to her village. She takes his hand, takes our hands, and pulls us both down onto our mats, and settles in between us. The fire casts a moving light. Into the firelight leaps a form. Is it a buck? I blink. It is a woman. She is wearing the horns of a buck. Another woman leaps into the light, then another, and another, all dancing, shrieking their battle cries, their Bodies painted white and black and red. Some wear buck's horns on their heads, and each carries a weapon. One a club, another a sword, another a bow and arrow. The young women leap and whirl in, around the fire, their battle cries now mixing with the music of drums and rattles. They bring the night alive with their warrior's dance. I watch, spellbound. It is mute magic. The music and dancing lasts for at least an hour. Then the women run off into the darkness of the forest, shrieking the same as when they came. There is a moment of hushed silence. Then everyone starts talking, laughing, with children running and playing, and everyone getting up from their mats. Pocahontas looks at me, her eyes glowing. Did you like it? She asks an Algonquin. I nod enthusiastically. Wow, I say. This is a new Algonquin word I learned from Namantek. Wow is their word of, for wonder and awe, and it is definitely the best word to describe what I have seen. I have heard 
about the masquerades in England, with their grand costumes and music and acting, but only nobles are allowed to see them. Now I have seen a New World masquerade while sitting next to a princess. With torches lighting our way, Pocahontas leads us back into the village to one of the houses. There, the young women dancers join us, still in their costumes of body paint. They all act as if they are in love with Captain Smith and our soldiers. They crowd around them, giggling and saying in English, Love you not me? Love you not me? I raise my eyebrows at Pocahontas. Who teach them that? I ask. She gives me an impish look and shrugs. I smell something delicious and turn to see several older women bringing in platters of food. There are large wooden bowls of steaming beans, peas and squash, platters of roasted fish and venison, baskets of bread and fruit. It is a feast. I eat until I can't stuff in another bite. When Namantek sees me yawning, he takes me by the shoulders and steers me toward the door. You will sleep in my house tonight, he says. Outside, the night air is brisk, and when we enter Namantek's house, it is toasty warm from a fire in the middle of the dirt floor. The smoke gathers in the high ceiling and escapes through a hole in the roof. Lining the walls, there are platforms made with poles, reed mats, and skins. I see that Namantak's brothers, the three little boys who greeted us when we arrived, are already asleep on the, on the platforms. He points to where I will sleep, next to the smallest boy. He gives me a deerskin blanket to keep me warm. As I lie on the bed, I can still hear the talking and laughing coming from the house where the feast is going on. Namantak is right, I think. His home is much better than Jamestown. There is more food and more joy to be had in one night here than a whole year in Jamestown. Thomas Savage only stayed for a little while in Werewakamoko. Why did he not beg to be allowed to stay long, stay forever? I wish I could come here to live. I would learn the Algonquin language even better, and I would be able to trade and help the colony. Namantek could teach me to make a bow and arrows and to shoot straight. I could hunt and help to feed us. I wonder if this is what Reverend Hunt means about making decisions out of love. Love for our newfound Indian friends. Love for our fragile New World colony. I remember when we first landed in Virginia, again the night of the Indian raid how I thought I hated all of the natives, and I wanted our men to shoot them and kill them. Those thoughts seem so strange to me now, now that Namantek has become my friend and Chief Powhatan has rescued us from cold and starvation, and the Princess Pocahontas has treated us as her countrymen. This new world is a good place to live, I think, as long as we live in peace with the Powhatan people. Then I remember how Captain Smith dressed as a warrior to come bring the news of the coronation of Chief Powhatan. How he said this news would not sit well with the chief, and I wonder how long the peace and the love will last. And that is the end of chapter 20.